Hi, everybody. Welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast Episode 9, where it is our mission to write, read, and discuss science fiction and fantasy that encourages and inspires its readers. I'm Hannah Heath, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of the Terebinth Tree Chronicles and Skies of Dripping Gold, and the Multimedia Manager for PFW. I'm joined today by my, by my two favorite Beths, Beth Wangler <laughs> and E.B. Dawson. And we are going to discuss the importance of using rest to rejuvenate your writing, along with tips for how to do it, because we know that's a really difficult balance to hit. Um, all right, so E.B., Beth, would you like to introduce yourself, followed by Beth Wendler? Yeah, hi there. I'm E.B. Dawson, editor-in-chief at Phoenix Fiction Writers. I write science fiction and fantasy, and am the author of the Creation of Jack series, the Lost Empire trilogy, and the dystopian short story Government Man. Hi, I'm Beth Wangler. I'm the launch coordinator for PFW. I write fantasy and fairy tales, and I'm the author of The Weaver's Blessing and the Firstborn's Legacy fantasy series. Awesome. So we have a lot of really cool news this month. So Beth, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, yeah, lots hap- the summer's been busy and a lot's happening this fall, so I'm excited. Um, first piece of news, which you may have heard about, um, I think the announcement's going out shortly as we're recording this podcast, um, that we're releasing an anthology for the Phoenix Fiction Writers, and mm-hmm. it's coming in November, da dun 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 Um, we had a a mini anthology in the spring, as some of you may know, but there were only, uh, like four authors who, who contributed this time. We've got all seven contributing a story and the theme is antiheroes, which is very exciting. (laughs) So there's a, there's a cover up now on the website. Um, you should go take a look at it if you want a teaser and keep your eyes open because we're going to be slowly releasing, um, the titles for the stories and short blurbs. So if you're interested about what these stories are about, keep your eyes open and and slowly you're going to get some more information on that so coming in november anti-heroes it's going to be exciting it's going to be very exciting yes yes and (laughs) then i guess i'll just go into our second piece of news because that's mine also um i have another book coming in october so the citizen is coming october 20th and it's the second book in my uh, lost empire trilogy so exciting yeah, I'm kind of terrified. It's like a month away now. <laughs> There's a lot to do, but but I'm excited. It's time. So it's going to bust down the world. And it's really, The Traveler was really just a introduction. There's so much now that's going to happen. So it's an important book. It's going to be good. Yes. If you haven't read The Traveler, you should go check it out. Shameless plug. Mm-hmm. So you're ready <laughs> for The Citizen. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely should. It's a really good book. Um, I agree with that. (laughs) So speaking of good books, uh, Kyle Robert Schultz is going to be relaunching his series um, and relaunching his brand this or in October. So you may have heard rumblings of that kind of on his Twitter and website. So keep your eyes peeled because he's going to be releasing some really cool information that you don't want to miss. So I'm not saying stalk him, but keep a close eye (laughs) out. So and get excited for that. And on top of that, uh, J.E. Perazzi has some cool releases that she are both recent and upcoming. So she just recently released Disintegration, which is book two in her Malfunction series. And it's amazing. Uh, have you two finished that book or are you reading it? I have not yet. I um, I read about halfway. I okay. actually had to stop just because of personal reasons, which that it got a little too dark for me. Um, but it was amazing that far. And I was, I just had to take a break from it and said, Oh, I'm sorry, Joan. She's like, it's totally fine. Um, (laughs) and I know where the series is going. So if you like dark gritty and, um, you should dive into it because it's really, it's just really well written. And the only reason that I haven't is because school started. And so I'm just teaching all the time and don't have much time anymore yeah I'm about a quarter of the way through and I love it but I'm also I school started for me and I'm not teaching I'm actually the student so it's different kind of busy but still still busy (laughs) yeah um but it's amazing so everybody should go check that out and she's also going to be releasing the fifth novella in the Raven Tree Society and that's an amazing series it's kind of a 
has a horror vibe going on, so it's perfect for Halloween time. So be sure to go read some of those because they're great. So. And then, um, so we were talking earlier about stalking. If you want to get better at stalking me, <laughs> the easiest way is to sign up for my new newsletter that I just started this month. Um, so that the link for that is on all my social media. And then right now you can currently get the Lake of Living Water for free on that. And then on Monday, I'm releasing another short story, Cadam Chieftain. Um, there's going to be a series of seven short stories to span the gap between Child of the Cates and book two in the Firstborn's Legacy series. So Cadam Chieftain is the first one. And it gives a little glimpse into what happens after the end of Child of the Cates. So if you'd like that for free, that is only going to be available on my newsletter. Awesome. So her newsletter is going to be linked in the description. So go subscribe to that. because Her stuff is always awesome. Do it. It's interesting. It's very different from her other work. I read it and mm-hmm. uh, I enjoy seeing a different perspective and kind of, I think she challenged herself with it. So, which is always good. So go read it. It's interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Awesome. All right. So now we can launch into story time. So does anybody have any interesting writing stories that they want to talk about that happened some sometime recently? Yeah, I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> I feel like mine is sad, but <laughs> it's good, though. Growth is good. So I think it's just interesting to see because I've been taking my writing so seriously and trying to build this business around it, um, how that kind of forces you sometimes to take a different approach to writing because you you don't have all the time in the world because deadlines are great even I guess if you're not trying to be professional it's just good to keep yourself on task but I about I think in August or September um I ran into I just found myself in a situation I hadn't really been before with a short the short story for our anthology actually so my anti-hero short story mm-hmm. where I had Uh, because I had multiple projects I was working on, not just that one. So I had multiple projects and different deadlines that I was balancing. And then I had to craft this story around a very specific theme. And, um, and I know we all know that you write, you, you show up and write, even if you don't feel inspired, that's just, if you're going to, you know, be a long-term author, you can't always wait for the muse. (laughs) But this one felt like, (laughs) like I was kicking and screaming the entire time. My muse was (laughs) kicking and screaming. Um, And I think just coming to that realization that um, at that point, you kind of have to trust the skills that you've learned as an author and just write by faith and, and then really listen to the feedback you get. Um, Cause I had to literally rewrite it about three or four times and people would be different parts of the story. were like, this just isn't working or this just isn't working. And I'd be like, I don't understand what's wrong with it. Uh, and um, realizing some stories are just going to be so much harder than others. And it doesn't mean it's bad necessarily. Um, and I think learning how to work through that is one of the most important pieces to um like longevity the the reason why some authors quit and some keep going if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so there's my sad tale it's not completely done I'll say that too I still have more revisions I need to do on it but it's much closer to what I wanted in the beginning so I'm hopeful I'll get it where it needs to be by the time the anthology publishes yes well if it makes (laughs) you feel any better um I was really struggling with mine, and I'm also not completely done with mine either, so. And I've really struggled with mine, as you know. So. We all thought, what a great uh, anthology, Antiheroes, but I think a lot of us have had trouble. It's a, I think for me, it's a tough arc to get, or it's a tough story to get into a, such a short space. I feel like it'd be easier to do with a whole novel, um, because you have to make them, you know, you have to do so much, you have to make them likable and because you don't want your reader to hate them I don't know there's just Mm -hmm. so much intricacy in it and and that it's really hard to do in a short span that's what I found so I don't know (laughs) yeah Yeah. yep so the good news is that means that this is going to be an excellent anthology because we've all put so much work into it it's true yeah I think I think for all of us it's been a you know 
not hopefully a breakthrough, but, you know, into a new level because we've all challenged ourselves. And we've taken our time, too. We've been patient with it. So I think there's been a lot of work. So it is going to be an excellent anthology. So everyone should buy it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, That's my story. <laughs> I was going to tell about how I was starting it. Now that Child of the Cates is done, I'm starting to actually write new things. And it's been so long since I've done that. And I used I used to always have to write by hand. But with Child of the Cates, by the end, I was able to, um, even when I was writing new scenes or new chapters, to write that on the computer. And I thought, oh, great. Now I can finally write on the computer and it'll be so much faster. But as I'm writing these first drafts, I've realized, nope, I actually have to write first drafts by hand. I need the extra thought time that it gives me so that was going to be my story only in more detail and then last night was back to school night mm-hmm. and um, one of my students has borrowed my book and is reading it which that is really sweet and also kind of frightening whenever somebody in real life reads my story I'm like oh no you know me and this <laughs> book can change the way you think about me and I don't know if I like that um so the student's mom came up to me and she's like it's so amazing that you wrote this book. It's so cool. And my son is reading it and he's loving it. And I want to read it when he's done. And part of me is like, this is awesome. And then part of me is like, I am so terrified to talk with you now for the rest of this back to school night. So I had to really wrestle with like keeping my terror at bay and being a mature human interacting with this parent while inside I was dying. (laughs) I'm sure you nailed it. <laughs> yeah. She was really, really kind and really sweet. Good. No, it's exciting. I do think it's interesting, though, because I feel like big name authors, people don't assume that their writing necessarily defines them. Like, it's like, oh, they wrote about this topic, but that doesn't mean, you know what I mean? But when, when they know you, it's much easier for them to to be like, oh, this is what you really think about the world or they, to associate yeah. it. And so it is scarier because I think it's, there is that level where they do kind of judge you by your book a bit, which is nerve wracking, but, mm-hmm. but it's a great book. So you have nothing to be afraid of because they're going to. This gonna is love true. It. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that that cracks me up because I had a specific story I was going to tell, but then I had lunch with a friend of mine today um, and got a story from that. So this friend of mine is not a writer, and I don't generally talk to my non-writer friends about my writing um, just for kind of similar reasons of like, well, what if they're, they're going to go read my stuff or I'm going to be telling them about this weird story that I'm writing and they're just going to like <laughs> be creeped out by me then. Um but today it came about because she asked me, so what are you writing? I'm like, oh, no. So I told her, oh, I'm writing a vampire story. Please don't think I'm creepy. <laughs> and then her eyes just lit up. And she goes, I was just listening to a podcast about the folklore of vampires. Just like out of the blue. I don't even know why she was listening to this podcast, except she just likes it. So she launches into this whole story about vampires and like the folklore of vampires. So now I know a lot more about vampires, so it's kind of helpful for the story. And I was also shocked because that could have gone in a lot of directions, and I was not expecting it to go that way. So, <laughs> so shout out to my non-writer friend, Zoya. I don't think she listens to this podcast, but if she does, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. yeah. <laughs> so ben- benefits to having non-writer friends is that can give you interesting perspectives into stories because she was telling me about some things that I had just honestly never considered so that's always cool Mm -hmm. um and I think that's pretty much my only story though I would I just wanted to say Beth um my anti-story anti-hero story was also giving me a really hard time as well (laughs) just because I like you said the arc is really hard to get in a short story and um my character kept getting worse instead of better. Like she became a worse person as the story went on. And I thought, well, this is not acceptable. So I keep having to rewrite and I finally got it. But yeah, it it just, it takes a long time. So (laughs) my first instinct was, oh, great. I I don't normally focus on antiheroes. So I can do something very different from what I normally do. And one of my critique partners hated it and was just like, no, it's really like, like you can do better because it's so cliche. And I was like, um so then I started over and was like okay 
So I shouldn't go too far out my wheelhouse because I should play to my strengths. And this makes sense. You know, you can't try to force something. But then, um, but then I, th- my antihero kept trying to turn into a hero. And I was like, this isn't, no, this isn't what's supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, okay, he's got to be an antihero. How do um, I do this? But I still have to do it the way that I tell stories. So anyway, it just brought out a lot. But I think it's really good growth. I think all of us have grown a lot through it. And, good so yay yeah. okay <laughs> we will prevail we got this all right <laughs> um okay so now we can get into the topic of the month which is tips for using rest to help um just with your general writing either writing career or just if you're writing and have not published anything yet rest is still very important to that so yes. uh first question is just a general why is rest important for your writing um, I think rest is important for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that like you are a human with a body and your body needs rest in order to function properly. If you don't get enough sleep, your body isn't going to be happy and then that will affect your brain and you'll have a hard time writing. Um, I think that in our culture, it's really easy to think of ourselves as like, oh, I just like, I just need to push my body to the limits and make it do what I need it to do so that my brain can do the things my brain needs to do. But that's not actually healthy. Like we, we are bodies as well as minds and those are very connected. Um, So making sure that you are physically healthy will help your mental health. Um, Like I've noticed for myself, the times where I haven't been getting enough sleep, the times where I've been like staying up too late, getting up too early, those are the times where my doubt and anxiety will come more into play. And I'll start thinking like, oh, why am I even doing this? I'm not qualified to be a writer. I'm terrible at this. But when I'm getting enough sleep, those those thoughts that are not true are a lot easier to keep at bay. Um, and then I also think that ideas for stories need time. That mm-hmm. we live in a society that's really focused on like produce as much as you can as fast as you can but for creativity that's actually counterproductive um a lot of the best stories are the ones that took the longest to create because that's where you get depth to it it's like if you're cooking cooking a really nice dinner you're not gonna just throw it together in five minutes it's gonna be marinating for a while and then cooking on low heat for a long time and our stories are kind of like that if we want them to have like a lot of depth and a lot of flavor most of the time that takes time and it needs some some time to just like steep in the back of our brains yeah that's a really good point um and i do think it's interesting that whole that our culture does really put an emphasis on just doing everything really hard and fast um And I think that's something I've been noticing a lot with uh, specifically college students is there's this weird like one up being like, I just pulled an all nighter and other people are like, oh, well, yeah, well, I haven't slept in two days and all I've had to consume is like these two Red Bulls. And it's this kind of like, this Uh is a like badge of honor. And then Mm -hmm. you kind of take a step back and think, well, that's really unhealthy. And also you're going to bomb your exam now because you, <laughs> you're not, you have not been treating yourself properly. And I think the same concept can be applied to writing is that we think, mm-hmm. well, we got to turn out these stories. We have to drink like tons of caffeine and get up at like five or go to bed at 12 and just write all of the time. But then even if that like makes for a good story on Instagram or whatever, it's not actually beneficial for you because your brain's just going to be dead and there's no way you're going to turn anything productive out. Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes when I was thinking about the topic for this podcast, I was like, part of it, you're like, of course, that's common sense. But I think for me, there's seasons where I go back to like, oh, no, 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 I need to push through and get this done. Um, and I started acting like it's funny because sometimes the the final edits of a book to me always feel a bit like finals when I was in college. Mm-hmm. It's like a similar, mm-hmm. OK, I have a deadline. I have all this to get done in the meantime. Um, and, and I start wanting to go to those bad habits of like, I'm just going to push through in one long haul and get it done. And I think uh, what I've been realizing, especially this is very relevant because this week um, 
I've been going out for walks like regularly, which has been, the weather has been nice. So it's like cool enough, like, you know, seventies where you're not sweating. Um, and part of me is always like, Oh, but that's a waste of an hour in my mind. I'm like, I could be getting, cause this is going so slow that I could get another chapter done, but I've been doing it anyway. Um, because there's like, your mind just needs the rejuvenation. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and I agree with uh, what Bethany was saying about, I like to compare my work to my books to soup because <laughs> I'm always talking. I've talked about it on my blog a lot about the submarine, about how ideas need time to grow um, and you need time to test those ideas against other things. And I think um, even when you're in, like for me, for editing, yeah, I could sit in and just keep hacking away at it. But um, if my mind is kind of going to sleep, you know what I mean? It's like you get out and you take a walk and you get a little more energy and your mind gets a little break and you can come back and you have a fresh perspective. And I think, um, in, in a practical sense that helps, it also helps your body obviously to not be cramped over a computer for, you know, that many hours in a row. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think to a certain extent, like even if I'm just sitting down, like, Oh, I'm get, have to get all this out right now. There's a lot of procrastinating that happens. Like yeah. I'll end up on Twitter. I'll end up doing all these things that are not working on my story. And meanwhile, there's this voice in the back of my head, like, Oh, you're not being good. Like you're doing this wrong. You need to be working like shame mm-hmm. on you. Shame on you for not working on your story right now. So I think realizing that you need rest and taking those rests in a like healthy and productive manner that Mm -hmm. is so much better for your mindset too because like if you are taking walks or taking time to paint or go out with friends or something that that's like guilt-free and then if you're not feeling like ashamed of yourself then that's healthier for your creativity too yeah absolutely and that's a great point the whole guilting yourself into or out of writing because that's something I always struggle with is if I'm writing it's always in the back of my mind well you should be doing schoolwork right now and then I'm in school thinking well you should be writing right now and then I'm trying to sleep and it's like you should be writing or doing school right now (laughs) so there's always like whatever I'm doing my brain finds a way to twist it into I'm not doing the right thing um so do either of you have like little tricks or gimmicks to help yourselves get out of that mindset and find a way to be able to take rest while having a healthy mindset about it because I can force myself to rest but it might not end up working out quite the right way if in the back of my mind I'm like shaming myself for taking a step back yeah that's a great point I think in one sense it's almost like insomnia in my mind you know how it's like if you can't sleep you shouldn't keep trying like you should get up for a bit and because if you lay in bed and keep trying and trying it's like it's worse type of thing so if I'm if I'm sitting and I'm obviously distracted I'm trying to write but obviously distracted and I'm just guilty myself over it to me that's a good sign of okay I need a mental creative break so I'm gonna stop guilty myself over it and not actually writing and I'm going to take a break or I'm going to time and then come back with a timer, you know, like, oh, OK, now 30 minutes focused because um, that's better for then. But I think also when approaching well, when approaching this podcast, it was funny. So I signed up for it and then I was talking to Jill Perazzi and I was like laughing. I was like, I just signed up for this podcast about rest or junior writing, but I'm they don't know I'm secretly a workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> but and she was laughing too. But I, but as I was thinking about it, what I realized too, and I, and I think the key for me is finding my creative rhythm, because honestly, sometimes I, I can work throughout the day, and sometimes I'll work through the evening. But I think as an as an artist, I've found my creative rhythm not only for the day, but you know, like with each project, I know what my limits are. Um, so rest doesn't have to look like oh, I'm taking a four day vacation. Um, it's giving myself the little breaks. It's being able to pace myself through a writing project. It's not, it's being okay with pushing back deadlines when I need to push back deadlines so I don't go crazy. So it's all of those things that it creates this healthy mindset of um, even switching between editing and um, free writing another rough draft that can be restful to my mind. So it can look in all different ways. I think it doesn't have to look like, you're pushing yourself away from the project for an hour and not thinking about it at all and forcing yourself to take a walk. I think there's a lot of different ways to 
not burn yourself out to rejuvenate yourself. And I like to call it my, my rhythm. So, um, whether that's throughout my day of when I get up and, you know, go do a chore or, um, take a literal break, or if I take a mental break, all those things play into it. And I think it's all, it's important if you're going to be writing more consistently, you know, throughout the year, instead of doing like a month and then taking six months off, I think it's important. You have to find that kind of balance for yourself and for your own style. Yeah. And I think that it's a shift in mindset and that you have to retrain yourself to think about breaks and rest in different ways Mm -hmm. um like for the past like three or four years I've been doing my best to uh, every week take one day where I just do nothing productive Mm -hmm. um like I could do things I enjoy but it can't be to like achieve a goal um and I try not to make plans at the start of that day and when I first started that it was crazy hard and I was just (laughs) like uh like I'm so bad I should be doing schoolwork I should be writing I should be doing all these things but it's gotten easier as I've practiced it mm-hmm. and now I'm like oh yes tomorrow on Saturday I'm not going to do anything and that's okay then Sunday when I get back I'll be able to do more than I was before um and somebody talked to me I don't remember where I heard this but somebody was talking about how there are these like patterns in our world of productivity and rest and like with our electric lights, we've kind of gotten out of that because at night mm-hmm. we can just keep being productive. Yeah, yeah. But for most of history, humans worked hard when the sun was up and then they had rest when it was night because they mm-hmm. weren't able to get things done. And so I think that I also try to remember that at night when it's like, oh, I need to go to sleep or it's late, I'm tired, I'm going to spend some time with family instead mm-hmm. of writing that I don't know retraining ourselves to think about like rhythms of rest and rest not as something that's bad but as something that's allowed and healthy yeah that's a great point um I know that for myself I've had to I'm not a naturally structured person I don't like to have specific things (laughs) that I have to do at specific times I just I'm too rebellious for that But I've had to realize that that's what I need to do in order to stay, like, mentally and physically healthy, um, is to set aside times each day where I'm doing specific things. So in the morning, I just read my Bible and drink tea, like nothing else. I'm not, Mm -hmm. you know, and I suck at it, honestly. Like, there are days (laughs) when I'm just not able to pull that off because my brain is just, I wake up and I'm like, no, I'm going to go do this and I need to send these emails and whatever. But on the days when I am able to force myself to stick to these schedules, I end up feeling better. And weirdly Mm -hmm. enough, I end up getting more things done. Because I think we always or I always think if I multitask, I can get more things done. Or if I drink my tea Mm -hmm. while sending an email while you know, listening to this podcast on this thing that I need to learn, then I can get more done. But then I just end up burning out halfway through the day. And then I'm not productive for the other half. So it is finding the structure that works for you and it can be hard especially if your um lifestyle is one that's constantly changing so like mine is every semester it's a different schedule because I'm working Mm -hmm. a different schedule I'm doing different classes I have different things on my plate so Mm -hmm. it's just a lot of like being willing to take a little bit of time to look at your day and think how can I structure this so that I have not only sometimes to rest, but sometimes to be doing other things that are not writing related or work related, like maybe like dusting or washing the dishes or things that are traditionally (laughs) work, but they're a little bit more relaxing and a little bit more um, laid back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of those things stimulate thought. And I think I found them uh, even the chore, like the chore things that it's like, Oh, washing dishes. Mm -hmm. All of those are super important, actually, for my creative process. Um, getting stepping away from the drafting, you know, or the editing, I, the ideas are still in the back of my mind, and and that's when they stew, and that's when they, you know, you start to see depth to them, and you start thinking about it from different perspectives. So it's all it can all be super important, even if you're if especially if you're feeling stuck or frustrated, like be making time for other activities might help you to get through that. Um, but it is. I think the most important thing you talked about changing schedules, 
again, is I think for you have to learn yourself again and your, what your limits are and to see the signs of when, oh, I'm getting burnt out, I need to stop or, or I can't handle this much um, is one of the most important things. And, and it changes like the first half of the year I was working full time and I had like a day or two a week where I could work on my creative stuff and um, and like my website and all of that. And so I would like because it was such a limited time, I, I could work for like eight, 10 hours straight. And it was fun for me. Like, oh, I get to do this now because the rest of my week was focused on all this other stuff. But, but right now, um, I don't have a full-time job at the moment. And so I have more time for that. And now I found I really need to pace myself because otherwise I'll, you know, if I try to do 10 hour days on it, obviously it's not going to work. So <laughs> it's interesting how now I have to take breaks from it and try to spread it out more. Otherwise my brain will just um, tire out and be exhausted because it's all the same thing. So there's definitely, you have to adjust to the season you're in. And again, I think learning your own limits as a creative person and learning when you're getting burnt out and learning um, the signs of that, because nobody else can tell you, oh, you need to stop or you, you know, you have to learn that for yourself, that kind of the time management, but also your, you know, the healthy mental state where you're at and to learn how you function as a as an author um is super important yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't have it mastered i'm not the, don't i don't think i'm the expert on it i think i'm i'm learning as i go too but i've learned a lot about that so yeah that's good yeah, and I will say, like, I always feel really hypocritical talking about this subject. Like, I just recorded a YouTube video about writer burnout. <laughs> but I, like, so I have all of these tips for how to avoid it and how to recover from it. And it seems mm -hmm. like if you were just to listen to this podcast, or, well, not after I say this, but listen to the part before I say this and watch the YouTube video, you'd think, oh, she gets it. Like, she's probably fine. I burn out at least once a month. It's mm -hmm. not good. So <laughs> there is the, um, there's a weird, at least for me, having to understand that burnout is kind of a weird, weirdly normal thing in my life. And I think it's specific to me, maybe because I have Lyme disease. And so I'm more prone to that because I can't do as much as I'd like to do. Um, so just going back to what you had said, Beth, about it being really specific to everybody. So it looks different for everybody mm -hmm. as to how you're dealing with it or how often um, you're having to recover from burnout or how much work you're even doing or how much work you're capable of doing compared to how much you need to do. Um, so being able to recognize all of your trigger points and all of your different struggles and then not feeling bad when you accidentally relapse and just know, okay, well, I learned a new thing <laughs> this month so I can do better next month. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's just a constant learning process, like everything with being an indie author. So. <laughs> Yeah. And I think there is a difference between your tank being empty and like burning out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think I hit it. I hit quite frequently where, oh, I'm like, my tank is empty. I need to slow down. But I think when I think burnout, I think like setting everything aside for like six months because I just can't handle it. Like, mm -hmm. and I don't, I mean, I think I maybe a couple of years ago went there, but I don't, I don't go there anymore. Um, I think some authors just quit because they just get fed up with it or they get exhausted. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So for me, burnout is always like when I reach the point where I've been doing, looking at something too much or working too much to the point where I'm, I feel physically sick when I sit down to work on a story. So what about you, other Beth? What is burnout for you? Um, for me, burnout is when I can't stand my story anymore and I don't want to keep going with it. Um, there, I don't know, I'm trying to think of when I've experienced it. It's been a while, but I think because I've been so intentional about like staying healthy and taking breaks when I need it and working on other projects when I need to, um, but I all the time feel way too tired, whether that's physically or emotionally or creatively tired to do anything. Um, and I think that that too will vary depending on what's going on in life. Mm -hmm. So if your schedule is changing a lot, you might need more time to adjust and figure out what that looks like in your current stage. And then like for me during the summer, I was able to do a lot. And then now that school's starting, I have to realize like, oh, 
sometimes I can write for a couple hours when I get home from work, but sometimes I can't do anything Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Um, Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's a good point about even day to day it's shifting because I know at least I like to think, well, if I was able to write this Thursday, I'm going to be able to write next Thursday. And that's just always what that's going to look like. But no. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think one of the biggest things I learned after college was that uh, like responsibilities and, and stress looks very different on paper than what it looks like in real life because and busyness. You know, I used to think, uh, I think it's easy. And most of the time in college, your business is mostly the same. It's like schoolwork and like maybe having a job or something. But as you get farther in life and well, I guess it depends on what's going on in your life, but um, there are some stressors or some responsibilities that just have a greater weight to them. And they like require more time and more brain power. And like, you have to, it's like, Oh, this shouldn't be taking this much brain power and effort but it is and it doesn't make sense but it is and you just have to work around that and I think that's that it's true for life like whether it's responsibilities or family or anything like that but it's also true for writing I think um and that day-to-day of you know one day the stressors in your life may just carry a greater weight and and you can't just brush that aside and say oh well yesterday was fine so it should be fine today it's like you have to be aware of that and and give kind of validate it and be like okay this is where we're at and and so and make room for it because then if you push through and force yourself through that it just makes you get to the stressed out burnout phase so Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense but (laughs) that does yes so if we let's say we just have a hypothetical fourth person sitting here who is like doing a really bad job of resting and finding that balance. If you had to give that random person like three or four uh, tips or pieces of advice, what would, what would that be? I think I would start by reminding them that like their value isn't tied up in how much they produce Mm -hmm. and it's okay. Like they will be just as great if they don't write today (laughs) And if they don't write tomorrow as if they did write all of that. Um, Because I think for myself, a lot of the times when I do think, oh, no, I have to keep writing, buried back in there is the fear that if I don't write, then I'm not good enough or I don't qualify as a writer anymore or I'm never going to put out this piece. Then, yeah. So what's the use of not writing? I think that sentence got away from me somewhere. (laughs) But Hopefully the idea got across. Yes. Then my other advice would be remember the things that you love outside of writing. Mm -hmm. Whether that's like you love jogging. If you do, I'm so happy for you and think you're slightly crazy. (laughs) Um, Or if you like painting or cooking or spending time with friends, um, going to going to libraries, going to parks, remember the things that you enjoy and do those without feeling bad about it. And also look at your schedule and see where are times where you feel really tired and choose those times as times to rest and to not create anything. That's really good. I feel like I don't have anything to add to that, Beth, do you? (laughs) No, that's great. I think for me, this is, well, it's just been very relevant for me is um, uh, you have to continually celebrate your successes Mm -hmm. um, because being a long-term author and like doing it as a career, you're always going to have open projects. And I like, I love finishing projects and I tend to like, oh, I, if I, if I keep working, I'll get that much closer. You know what I mean? There's this like, but I'm almost there, but I'm almost there. <laughs> and, um, but you're always going to have open projects because once you finish that, you're going to start another one. And so there's this, uh, in, in order to manage that, I think one of the biggest things is to, you have to celebrate your successes. You have to look back at, oh, but these are all the things I've accomplished, um, I, that's something that really helps me because then it reminds me like, this is a journey 
and this is just a step and it's not, this doesn't all have to be done next week. Um, it's okay to be patient with it because look at what I've accomplished. Like I'm going to, you know, slowly step by step. So, and keeping your long-term girl goals, um, is a big one. Like for me, um, cause there is this, there's this trend of, uh, we were talking about f- producing mass producing earlier. Some, uh, indie authors, uh, write a ton and then produce and like sell every month and their sales go up really high because some people like that but that's not sustainable for everybody and it's definitely not for me so it's like okay I may not be where I want to be with sales or with followers or fans or any of that but for me it's like I'm in this for the long run like I want to do this for you know the rest of my life or whenever so then you look at that perspective it's like okay I don't I can't do everything in a week you know this is a long-term goal Um, so I need to have a sustainable lifestyle so I don't burn out, you know, I need to find my writing rhythm because this isn't just a month hobby or even a year hobby. This is something I want to, you know, be able to live my life and write and do it sustainably and still, you know, and not have my relatives disown me because I never show up (laughs) on their birthday. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, no, this is, you know, you have to find that you have to make time for those things. Cause it's just like, if it was a job, you know, and you're a workaholic who never sees your family, they're going to get mad at you. So it's the same thing. So I joke mm-hmm. about being a workaholic, but the truth is that I'm actually quite, cause I've learned myself. Um, I take a lot of little breaks. I really do. And I just to watch TV or read um, and to rest my mind. Uh, and I've learned how to do it pretty naturally. So I don't think about it too much. Um, but yeah so that's all I got (laughs) nice yeah yeah and I did like um your point about making sure you celebrate your successes because for me I always forget to do that and then I also think it's really important to remember why you started writing in the first place Mm -hmm. because I tend to put a lot of stress on myself when I look at my books and think oh those were well received I need to make sure that my next stories get you know good reviews and there are I start thinking about all of these ways that I need to make sure that I'm marketing these stories well and uh, getting people to read them and review and all of that kind of stuff and I kind of forget to stop and remember why I'm writing these stories in the first place because I didn't start writing these stories so I could get good reviews on Amazon like that's not what this Mm -hmm. was about so I have to take a step back and remember this is why this is important to you so I need to remind myself to be a writer first and then an indie author because they are two different things one is writing for a purpose and a meaning and because it's important to you and because you have something important to tell other people and then being an indie author is taking that, but then also turning it into something marketable, which is awesome. But if you place that above the actual process of writing, then things can go downhill really fast. Um, So remembering that. And then two for me, and this is huge, and I always have a hard time with it, is don't compare yourself to other writers. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so huge. I think that like, I at least have a tendency to go online and see, oh my gosh, this person published another story or, oh, look at this person's like Instagram feed. They're reading so many books. And -hmm. then I think, well, I need to be keeping up with this. And now I need to go and read all the books and write all the books. And it's just, it's so unhealthy. And it's not, that's not, it's the same thing as remembering like what why you started you didn't start so that you could be like those other authors you started to write because you're writing for yourself and to be yourself so there should never be you striving to be somebody else because you're not and you're not ever going to be and that's okay um so just important to look at that and then also remember like social media is always a very like cleaned up version of other people's lives so whatever Mm -hmm. you're seeing on there is not always completely accurate so Mm -hmm you shouldn't be looking at that and then feeling pressure to just continue working hard. And I mean, while it is good to work hard, you shouldn't be overdoing it to the point where you're striving for this thing that just isn't real. (laughs) So those are two pieces that I always have to remind myself of. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's easy, especially if you're just starting out to be so enthusiastic to just want to jump into everything and, or even if you have a limit, like you got one workout and it's like, oh, that felt so good. Let's get to the next one. But it's like the difference between a sprint and a marathon. 
it's like if you go yeah you can sprint a short distance and you put a ton of energy into that but then you're tired and it's like if you want to do this for a while and keep doing it and not get exhausted you can't start your marathon you know at a sprint it seems mm-hmm. like you're going to get to the end faster it really seems like it for a while but then you're just gonna crash and burn and it's like <laughs> yes. you have to go slowly and you have to take those water breaks <laughs> um and it's see I get there a lot where I'm like you know I'm oh I've been doing this for a while if I speed up I'll get there faster but it's like I have to slow myself down again be like no Beth this is the pace you can handle and that's okay Okay, you maybe you have to push a deadline back. That's okay. Like you have to, um, you really have to pace yourself to keep in the race and to keep in a healthy place. So it's that age old um, story of the tortoise and the hare. Yes. So we need to be slow and steady <laughs> to win the race. Yes. So. Dun, dun, dun. And also, I think that we have to remember sometimes when we see authors publish a lot at once. It's because they took a long time to get there and we just see the finished product. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. So we don't don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, they could have been writing those for the last five years and they just published them all at once. And or they might (laughs) they might be farther along the path and or have a different and some authors, you know, choose to put their work out with less revision and editing and maybe it's a little less quality draft and but they're fine with that and it sells it's like okay that's their brand you know what I mean and it's mm-hmm. um so yeah the comparison is dangerous because it's true you don't know what's going on behind or you don't know if if they're hiring people to edit for them and you're doing all the editing yourself that's a huge yeah. difference so you can't beat yourself up by comparing so right Awesome. I hope those tips helped everybody. Did we have any like last thoughts on the topic? Be kind to yourself. Yes. <laughs> That's my last. Yes. <laughs> you, you are worth you you deserve rest and, and you deserve breaks too. So. <laughs> yes. I agree with that. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Yes. Get sleep. It's important. <laughs> oh, accountability, I think, would be my last. Oh. You know, especially if you, when you when you learn your weak areas, like tell people and tell people like where you're at and keeping that if you don't have because I, I may take it for granted, but I definitely have a circle of writers around me who I can talk things through or who uh, when I'm discouraged, they can encourage me. And so that's important too to have people who can help hold you accountable or tell you to take a break if you need one or just be a listening ear. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was a time when I finished Child of the Kids, I was like, I need to take a week off. And I was so bad at it. And so I told uh, Evie Dawson, I told her, I need to not do anything. If you see me doing anything past this time, like yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I ever did. I think sometimes just saying that to another person helps you to be, you yeah. know, Oh, I've told someone now I really have to do it. I was so proud of her. I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I kind of work like through it when I have the time throughout the day. But like I said, I'll take the little breaks, but I don't tend to take big ch- Well, sometimes I do. It depends on what it is. And if it's like, I don't know. I'm very sporadic. I have a system. It works for me, but it probably doesn't make sense to other people. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So, uh, moving into book clubs. Um, what what books is uh, is? Wow, I'm dying. I don't know how to say that question correctly. One of you knows, I'm sure. <laughs> what books are you reading? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Who, well, somebody else talk. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I am only reading one right now because I finished a couple. So, I mean, I'm currently rereading dune by frank herbert um i picked up so okay so i read this book i think twice when i was in high school um someone gave it to me because it's like oh it's a classic you have to read it and i enjoyed it i didn't love it but like i couldn't really uh, i i respected it it's like a quite a piece of fiction it's very interesting if i haven't read it you should read it um but it's been a long time since i've read it and now that i'm an author and I know so much more about story structure and about all the intricacies. I'm kind of picking apart 
things I picked up instinctually as a reader. And now I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, that makes sense why I felt that way because like, it's just interesting to see what the author's doing. So it's, it's, and I'm, the reason I'm rereading it is because I'm actually going to, I hope to keep going with the series. I recently picked up books two and three. So I was just like, I should, I've heard they're good. I should read them. Found them in a bookstore. So that, but then I was like, okay, I need to reread the first book. It's been like 10 years. So it's been interesting. It's going slowly. And again, I'm not loving it. Um, but it's interesting. I can pick apart kind of reasons why now it's very fatalistic book, which I kind of knew when I was a teenager, but now that I'm reading it and it's like the author pretty much tells you almost everything that's going to happen like from the beginning through these mm-hmm. different little things. And then you kind of just have to watch it play out. And sure, there's interesting things, but there's just a lot that that this maybe not my preference also in how he builds his characters and things like that. Um, and then I think one of the things that bothers me the most, though, is that he throws in these world building things that I would love to see more of, but it's not his priority. And, and so he'll just throw it in and move on with the story. And I'm like, what? So anyway, that's my, so far, those are my critiques of Dune. But if you guys, uh, if anyone's interested, and you should follow my Goodreads, because I'm doing kind of a more detailed analysis as I go. So there, that's that's me. (laughs) Yeah, I read that book uh, last year for the first time and remember thinking like, well, this has a lot of really good points to it. I don't like that book at all. Um, (laughs) But it's still like, it's not a bad book. I just don't like it. Like there are parts that are really well done and then other parts where I think, yeah, that was a questionable writing choice. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not very personal at all. And I I realize now that I've read more, I think he's, he's imitating Isaac Asimov in what he did with foundation, but I think Asimov did it way better. so it's, yeah, it's very impersonal and, and the characters and the choices they make, it's hard to connect with them. So I think that's hard, especially for modern readers. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I don't think, I think he's good at some world building. I think he struggles at other parts. Everyone mm-hmm. praises him for his world building. But again, I think there there are some difficulties with how he incorporates the story with it. It's not so natural. It's kind of forced anyway. Yeah. We'll see. I'm not very far into it, but <laughs> for this third read. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting having been a writer for longer now, being able to notice specific things in stories that I'm reading. And yeah. like, oh, that's why I'm not really enjoying this right now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm reading a lot right now, but most of that is because I'm an English teacher, so I'm reading several things with students, and yeah, so that's why. Um, But I'm reading King's Warrior by Janelle Leanne Schmidt, and I started Smellsmith, I can't talk right now, I started Spellsmith and Carver Magician's Rivalry by H.L. Burke. And then I'm also reading The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, The Most Dangerous Game, and I can never remember the author's name, Um, The Odyssey, and Dracula. Oh, so that's the good stuff. Yeah. I've read most of those. Not Dracula or what was the other one? Sleepy Hollow. I've read Uh, all the others. (laughs) Sleepy Hollow is a really fun short story and this is a good time of year for it It there's heavy satire that is so great Um, and it's very clever because he doesn't tell you outright what happens but he gives you hints and you can be a little detective and then Dracula I love this book Um, I read it for the first time last year last school year and I was really glad that the student wanted to read it again Um, it's really interesting because he has characters who are heavily influenced by enlightenment and rational ideas, but also are Christians. And then they're encountering this like Eastern superstition and trying to fit all of these different ideas together. And also all of the characters are like legitimately good people, like good deep inside. And they're still so interesting, which I feel like is really hard to achieve for stories. And then it's told through different 
different forms of literature. So a lot of it will be their characters' journals, there's some newspaper clippings, and so you get a lot of different perspectives that flow together really naturally. That's really cool. I have not read that book, and I keep meaning to, so I'm going to put that on my list. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, she was trying to convince me, I think, last fall to read it, and but I just don't know. I just can't I can't handle vampires so I'm still very, a little hesitant but we'll see so I, I don't know that I will even read your story Hannah I'm just nervous I'm gonna have Jill read it first and then we'll see but <laughs> the vampire isn't on screen for most of the time so yeah I will say that my vampires are not classic vampires so I think that you'll be okay with them um but we'll see yeah I think letting Jill read it first is a good idea she's fearless she's fearless Yes. Uh, let's see. For me, I actually haven't been reading much at all. Um, I, I'm not even sure why. I just haven't. Um, so, well, I mean, obviously school started, so I've been reading. I haven't had to read a lot for that, actually, but my work also started, and my work is literally just reading other students' essays. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I'm just kind of all read out by the end of the day. Um, So I've been reading comic books, specifically Darth Vader's comic book series. It's the new one by Charles Seoul, or Seoul, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, And it's all right. It started out really strong, and it's just been kind of like meandering. So I feel like it's just dragging out a lot. So I'm stuck because I want to like it because I like Darth Vader. (laughs) <laughs> also probably shouldn't like that character i still do though <laughs> um, the prequels ruined it for me i could like him if it weren't for the whole murdering younglings thing um but yeah it's an it's an okay series so but that's pretty much all i've been reading one of my friends makes a solid well he makes an argument with evidence for darth vader being a really great dad <laughs> Whoa. so i just think it's really funny <laughs> I would be really interested to hear that. <laughs> uh, the points I can remember are that he doesn't know he has kids for most of the time. And then when he does, he's like, hey, son, I want to, like, fix that. Come join me and we'll do things together. <laughs> and then when he finds out he has a daughter, he's like, oh, yeah, you can come along, too. <laughs> he's willing to just... do, like, family activities, like murdering people as a family. <laughs> That's... Yeah. Good, yay! Great <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Oh. So I don't. I, I th- he's an interesting character though, and I, um, uh, I love the TV series, the Clone Wars, the cartoon series they did between the second and third movie, because you actually get to see more of him, in, like in between all the angst and drama of. <laughs> prequel movies and and they do his character really well and it's interesting some of the things they play out and one of them I just it made me think of it he's one of them he sees the future and who he's going to become and he's like so like angry he's like I can't become that person and like he's like heartbroken like I'm not gonna let it happen but then his memory gets erased of course so he doesn't remember seeing so it's so and it's just you're just watching it like oh no (laughs) So he does become a person. It's all very tragic. Oh, man. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Yay for reading, mm-hmm. though. I want. To, I might pick up another book. I tend to read two at a time, kind of, right now. Um, and I think, because this is a reread, especially, that I, sh- I want to pick up something new. So, But I'm not, I haven't decided what it will be yet. But anyway. Awesome. All right. So, my brain is not working. If you liked this podcast, I'm trying to remember how I close this out. If you like this podcast, leave us a review on iTunes. Give us, a, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. You can follow us online at phoenixfictionwriters.com and on Twitter at phoenix underscore fiction. We're also on Facebook as Phoenix Fiction Writers. And yeah, you can also find me at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website, hannahheathwriter.com, where you can link to my blog and all the other social medias that I'm on. So be sure to follow PFW and me and say hello. And other Beths, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at, on Twitter at, at Beth underscore Wangler. That's W-A-N-G-L-E-R. And then on my website, www.bethwangler.com. Yeah, and I'm also on Twitter at, at 
eb dawson writing and and my website is www.ebdawsonwriting.com and um Yeah, actually, I want to add something, too, though. If you guys have great thoughts about rest and rejuvenation or what you guys do, I'd love to hear some of that in the comments below this video or wherever, um, because I'm always learning new things. So, yes, as we have said, we all struggle with this, even though we're giving you advice about it. So help us, too. Yeah. Leave a comment. Thanks for listening, guys. Yes. Thank you for listening. And remember to tune in next month. It's going to be our next podcast will be October 24th. And it's going to be J.E. Parazzi and K.L. Plus Pierce discussing writing lessons learned from the Chronicles of Narnia. So it's going to be super fun and nerdy and so full of C.S. Lewis. So be excited for that. And thank you, everybody, again for listening. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.